Good morning, dear saints, and blessed Easter. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is, well, Monday, April 8th. It's Solar Eclipse Day, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Now, this morning we're turning our attention to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 35, the rest of the chapter. In these verses, Solomon presents godly wisdom and understanding as treasures which surpass all material wealth, and he emphasizes their unparalleled value in securing a fulfilling and prosperous life. Through these verses, he delineates the manifold blessings of embracing wisdom, including longevity and peace, divine favor and protection. And Solomon tells his readers to lean not on their own insight, but to trust wholly in the Lord. Well, folks, whether you're listening to us over the air in St. Louis at AM 850 or online live stream or on demand at KFUO.org or through the KFUO mobile app, I'm just glad you're here. So settle in, open your hearts and your minds. We are about to begin. Thy Strong Word is graciously supported in part by the good folks over at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. When you get a moment, you can go online at lhfmissions, with an S on the end, .org, lhfmissions.org, to learn more about how they, well, they publish and distribute books that are Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Reformation-driven. So learn more about them online when you get time. And if you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can email me at pastorboo at gmail.com. I regularly get emails from listeners, and I love hearing where you're from and how Thy Strong Word is a part of your devotional life. If you send a question while we're on the air, I'll do my best to get it out on the air. On our last free text first Friday, I had several emails come in with questions. Not all of them got to the air, but we answered all of them, at least between me and my guest. So that uh, that sometimes happens too. So send a question. We'll do our best to answer it. You can also find me uh, on Facebook. Just search for Phil Boo. Or really, if you're brave, call in. <laughs> Nothing to be afraid about. Just call 1-800-730-2727. Friendly board operator or answer that phone. You can give him your question or you can come on the air and we can talk about it. All right. Well, let's get to the matter at hand. And that is Proverbs, the second two thirds. And joining us this morning, it's the Reverend Brian Davies. He's pastor of Lord of Glory Lutheran Church in Grays Lake, Illinois. Good morning, Pastor Davies. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Thanks so much for having me and uh, blessed continued Easter celebration to you and to all of our listeners. Well, uh, you know, Easter, we talk about, uh, right, like empty tomb on Easter Sunday, sort of empty church on the second Sunday of Easter. Um, I don't always see it that way. I, I sometimes see it as the guests have gone home and it's kind of just like the family back together. I don't know. How was attendance at your church the Sunday after we Easter? Had a, we had a good day, and I don't, uh, I, don't I, I get a little concerned seeing those, you know, memes on Facebook because they seem so judgmental, you know, sure. but uh, we had a great day and uh, I, th- I think sounds like you did too. And, and we'll take what the Lord gives. Yeah, we did, you know, and, and I have observed even in my short ministry, um, about 15 years now, uh, and then you add to the years as a vicar, et cetera. Uh, I, I, I've observed that there actually are, at least in my experiences, and, and I've served in a couple areas of the country. Few and fewer what we call Easter and uh, Christmas Christians mm. or Christmas and Easter Christians, whatever you want to call them. Those who make their way into the church during the high festivals, and we'd like to see them more, but we don't, and we're glad for their presence. But I'm seeing that a little less and less. It seems like those uh, types of Christians um, don't, I don't know. I mean, it just, it seems like most of the, the bulk of the folks who come are family visiting from out of town and many of whom who go back yep. to their churches. So I don't, I don't know if that's a shift in the culture or maybe it's just, uh, just something I've observed and isn't happening globally, but I don't know. It's just interesting. I completely agree with you. Actually, I'd be very curious to see some statisticians tackle that. My observation is the era where people only came to church on Christmas and Easter, kind of derives from an idea that Christianity was kind of like a driving force in the culture. And so on those days, people who were nominally connected to faith felt like, oh, I really should go, right? Now I feel like Christianity has lost that place in culture. So that mm-hmm. pull to find a place on Christmas and Easter 
diminishes because there's no more societal pressure as much to find a church on Christmas and Easter. Instead, to me, what you'll find is, you know, we have a, many hundred folks who call this church their home, but for varying reasons, every Sunday attendance is difficult for them. So we don't see them every Sunday, but then all of those folks come on Easter and Christmas and a couple other days because, yeah. you know, the world does slow down a little bit on Easter. There's no youth sports games on Easter Sunday morning, at least not right now that I'm aware of. Thank God, at least we still have that. So because Amen. the world stops, it allows all of our Christians to come and settle and worship on Sunday. And to me, I'll take that. Oh, agreed, agreed. And, and one last thing before we move on. It, it kind of a catch-22, though, too, because for those Christians who, for whatever reason— tend to only make it on the high feasts. They usually come to like hour and a half long services. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you want to tell folks, you know, it's like 54 minutes regularly. So come <laughs> next week. Uh, it won't be as much of your time. Because if I only came at Christmas or Easter, I would be like, man, how do you do this every Sunday? And the answer is we don't. <laughs> yeah, we don't. right, right, right. But, all right, well, let's move on. Go ahead and open us with a word of prayer and we'll dive into Proverbs uh, 3. Let's have a prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for the gift of your word. And as we dive into Proverbs 13, what a treasure uh, this is. Thank you, Lord, that you've left it for us. Pray your blessing upon our study of it. Wherever you have us and our listeners, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would open our hearts and minds to be receptive to what you have for us. And I give you thanks that we have the gift of your word in our own language. And I pray your blessing upon those uh, who are working and striving to get the word of God into original languages. Give them strength and courage and wisdom in their work. And bless us now in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to take this in chunks. We're going to try to go, uh, you know, a little steadily, not too fast, not too slow. And so we are in Proverbs chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 13 through 18 to get us started. Here we go. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit is better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who laid hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. All right, so the thought isn't quite done, but we're just getting into it. And and we're getting this sort of um, uh, him, maybe for lack of a better word, extolling wisdom by saying that the one who finds her, it's been personified, folks will remember, um, is going to be blessed or happy. We talked about this a little bit with the last time too, but as we read these, it's hard not to kind of fall into maybe this prosperity gospel kind of thinking that, you know, as long mm-hmm. as you seek after God's wisdom, he's going to throw you a bone and, and give you these worldly blessings. Uh, maybe you can open that up for us too, or, or anything else. Lead us through these first few verses, please. Yeah, there's a lot here. Um, <clears throat> I would say, it's interesting. At first glance, anytime you're talking about, um, you know, gold and silver and jewels, and yeah, it can like bend that way, right? Like, oh, is that saying that this is going to be the result? Well, actually, a closer look at the text tells us that's not the case, and it's it's better than. So, you know, so the gain from wisdom is better than gain from silver, more profit better than gold, more precious than jewels. And to me, all we got to do is survey the landscape of those who have, quote unquote, you know, got it all, been on top of the world, yet it fell with a great crash, right? Because the house was built on sand and it was a pursuit of gold and recognition from the world, um, that is a tower that cannot stand. Here, um, we're getting counsel that pursuing that that comes from the Lord is going to be better than what you get from gold or silver or jewels. So it's kind of like the opposite of the prosperity gospel. You follow me? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think the key verse is kind of right there in the middle, the second half of 15. You know, he says, nothing you desire can compare with her. 
and and then right. on each side of that we have silver, gold, jewels, long life, riches and honor, ways of pleasantness, which I kind of interpret as an easy life, a uh, peace. Mm. So so it's like all the things that you can think of that you might want from life. You're absolutely right, brother. He's saying she's better than that. And she, of course, yes. is being godly wisdom. Uh, yes. And so if you want to be blessed in this life, then don't seek after these worldly things. So, no, I agree with you wholeheartedly that it's kind of an anti-prosperity gospel. But how often mm -hmm. do does either the unscrupulous preacher or even our own sinful nature sometimes – you know, turn God into like a, a superhero or a divine bending machine. Like if we can just keep him happy, he'll, he'll give us blessings. And that, yeah. that kind of falls into the, well, to the errors of, of the pagans. Yeah. <clears throat> and I always find it helpful to, um, to use the term in God's economy, you know, like how things work with God. That's different than how things work in the world. You know, how things work in the world is, you know, the pursuit of money and early retirement and how much can you obtain and how much can you pursue? Like that's, that's the best thing you can find. And then here, um, actually the best is life with wisdom, life with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm struck by how uh, 13 starts with blessed is the one who finds wisdom. It's kind of a callback uh, to verse four in chapter three. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man It kind of speaks to the pursuit that likely lived within the people in this context, which is still at work today, remarkably so in year 2024, that pursuit that the world has to find wisdom outside of God, right? Like it, whether it's in vocation or whether it's in your children or grandchildren or whether it's in um, travel or vacations or whether it's in accolades by bosses or the world or Instagram or YouTube followers or the like. Um, here, wisdom is it, it, it is pursued and it's found ultimately in Jesus. I think that um, in in relation to what you're saying, I'm thinking of, of Werner Heisenberg, who said, the first gulp from the glass of natural sciences will turn you into an atheist, but at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. And mm. so if I can take some liberties, um, even if maybe he didn't actually ever quote that, it's still a great quote, because yeah. what we have here is this idea that as you seek after even natural knowledge, then the you know you can be led astray. You can be mm. look. You can look at the world. You can look at education and knowledge and and even worldly wisdom and say, "Ooh, these things are valuable." And but but they're going to turn you away from God. But but the more you look into the world, the more you open yourself up to how did these things come to be? Why are things the way they are? Uh, you really have to purposefully reject God at the end of the mm. day, which is why the proverbs and psalms themselves say. You know, the fool says that there is no God. Mm, that's right. The that's unwise. a great quote, by the way. Yeah, I, it's, it's it's attributed to Werner Heisenberg, but um, I'm not 100 percent sure that that, you know, you know how it is with quotes. <laughs> yeah, don't quote me on that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, we have this beautiful uh, just sort of depiction, though, of because who isn't who isn't in this life? searching after gold and silver i, I mean mm. the fact is even even the most room the remote hermit off the grid still relies on on somebody in this world and gold and silver are the aspect of of trade it's the aspect of how we interact with one another who doesn't want a long life e even faithful christians who say this life is a gift of god i want a long life uh, and, and maybe like it doesn't say things like fame it says honor though and you know who doesn't want to be respected who doesn't want peace and an easy life but but we just see that that is not as we look at the scriptures as a whole what god promises those who follow him he promises that eventually but really so long as the world has set itself up, up as an enemy against god uh you know those things are going to come a little harder to christians not easier and so there is something about being blessed because we know God. I want to add two more verses and then um, we'll turn it back to you. So 19 and 20 say, Yahweh by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open. 
and the clouds drop down the dew. So, you know, if we've been reading, it shouldn't come as any surprise. But the point here is that true, valuable wisdom is being in connection with the creator who reveals that, or at least reveals what we can understand. No doubt. And uh, I teach a Bible class on, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, on Thursdays with another pastor at a retirement facility, and we've been going through the book of Job. Boy, that's a challenging but insightful book. And we finally got to chapter 38, which is probably, you know, the most well-known chapter I know of in the book of Job, which is where God kind of says, hey, you know, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? You know, tell me if you were. And really spends many, many verses talking about the magnitude of the work of creation, kind of talking about, hey, were you there when I made the waves and the sea stop here, you know? And and it actually gives us some more detail to the work of creation than we even get in Genesis 1 and 2, if you think about it. Because it thinks about the, just speaking of the magnitude of what God had to do to lay the foundation for the earth to be built and created, right? So creation is a very important aspect of who God is. In fact, the Bible kind of calls back to it in the Psalms and Proverbs and Job and the New Testament and everything. So it's a call back here, Proverbs 13, I'm I'm sorry, Proverbs 3, 19 and 2 20, uh, just for us to remember, hey, this is how wise God is, that he was able to, you know, work this work of such magnitude. And I do, you, you mentioned Job 38. I love that section. I, I kind of call that the who do you think you are section because <laughs> yeah, exactly. there, there is an aspect in our lives where we have to remember, and it is humbling, that we are mere creatures. It doesn't mean we're not loved. It doesn't mean that Christ didn't die for us and that doesn't give us special value. No, all those things are true. But but ultimately, when compared to God, we just don't have any standing. And and, and that yep. is what Job experienced, and that's what we experience, and that's what wisdom tells us. So if we think we are somehow equal to God or a God is somehow accountable to us, then we're not going to recognize the sheer blessing it is to have been chosen by him as a mere yeah, right. poor, miserable sinner, and yet he forgives us. If somehow we think we're even close to God in, I guess, importance or authority, then, yeah, that's not going to hit the same way, which is yeah. why I think the devil has spent the great, great bit of time over the past few uh, millennia uh, basically taking people from a trust in God to – uh, trust in self to now I'm God or there is no God and there is no truth. It's even worse. And so I think this is why, because we know that that true wisdom uh, puts us you know, basically back on par where we need to be. It knocks us down a few notches, but then it's also a blessing. It is a blessing, and we're better off with that mindset, you know. And, of course, don't want to hit too hard on this, but any talk about, like, human rights and rights that we have, like, be really careful with that. And I get I get what we're talking about when we speak of those fundamental rights. And of course, people have them. But understand that, you know, God is the creator. It's incredible that he even invited us to be a part of this, right? That he created you, that he created me. He didn't have to do it. We have no standing before him other than that of a beggar. Um, and in Jesus Christ, he then you know, wins us to be called sons of the most high God, but it's only because of what he has done for us. Just one more element that I was wondering if you'd comment on, and that is the tree of life imagery. So we're going back just a little bit, but verse 18, she, wisdom, is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Uh, the tree of life is equated with all kinds of things in Proverbs, uh, desire, gentle tongues, fruits of the righteousness. Uh, uh, we also have some imagery about the fountain of life. But but the tree of life, I guess it brings to my mind the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden um, mm. and the tree of life. And, and this idea, of course, that we are saved by the precious tree upon which Christ died. So this tree mm. of life imagery, I think that's interesting and worth noting. Have you ever been to Arizona? No, but I'd like to one day. I, I have a couple snowbirds that go down there. Yeah, put it on your list. My in-laws are there, and uh, they have a grapefruit tree and an orange tree in their backyard. And I've been there when it's been in season. And, 
the idea of walking to your backyard and getting basically unlimited grapefruits, like as much as you could eat, like fresh off a tree, right. is pretty unique. You know, the idea of like going to another side of your yard and getting enough oranges to make, you know, freshly squeezed orange juice with no problem. Um, I grew up in New York. Uh, the big, you know, we produce tons of apples. I mean, I know what it's like to be in a an abundant orchard and have as many apples as you could eat. That's what I think of when I think of tree of life. I think about abundance. I think of it never ending. I think of it as giving you more than you ever could want or imagine or need. And it just kind of like coming in abundance and being so beneficial to that who who receives it. Oh, I like that. You know, I, and I was thinking of, you know, I haven't been to Arizona and I haven't experienced that directly. It did have an apple tree at one of my parsonages. But when I was in Haiti, too, you know, the, it was unique tropical fruits, a little different than when I'm used to. And so you would go outside and there would be mangoes hanging in the trees and there would wow. be bananas just hanging down, uh, just walking down the road. And, and so, it, yeah, I, I love that imagery of well, it kind of reminds us again of the garden where, where God's taking care of us from the from the green plants and we are, we're able to be uh, uh, at peace, not worried about where our next food comes from. And so, yeah, this tree of life, this symbol of symbol of renewal, a symbol of just ble- over, oh, I guess, overflowing blessings. And so that, that's, and that's right. what we're seeing here. Right. That's what wisdom gives. Now, in Bruce, can next, we pause for can we pause for just a quick second? Did that's you say good. you were in Haiti? Were you a, a missionary to Haiti? Oh, I I went as a young man. I went uh, when I was 14, and then I went again when I was oh, – after I became a pastor, so like 2014, I think. So when I was For a short-term 34. mission trip or for a long trip? It, no, 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 just short terms. Okay. I mean, you've seen likely what, what's happening there lately. Yeah, I have some friends who are – and where I also would visit in a little town called Nepali, which is right outside of um, – um, Oh, gosh, I forgot the name already. Uh, Carfu, which is uh, what, like the poorest slum in the Western Hemisphere, from what I understand. And I asked them directly, you know, what's going on. And, and they're so far out in the country, they're not as affected as, say, the people in Port-au-Prince. Uh-huh. But, but, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. Does the LCMS have a presence there? From what I understand, they do not. However, we have a very strong presence in the um, – Officially, I should say, and I could be wrong, but from what I understand, we don't. Yeah. We have one in the Dominican Republic, but we have yeah. lots of very faithful LCMS folks who do a lot of good work in Haiti, though. Wow. Thanks be to God for them. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So, sorry for the distraction, but I was just curious because I've been doing a lot of reading about what's happening there. We had a missionary that our church supported in Haiti when I was growing up, and that was my first exposure as a young boy to like the third, you know, that the, that part of the world that struggles. And so, it's always kind of been on my radar, and just been following what's been happening there lately. It's been it's very difficult to see. It is, and they've had their uh, certainly their fair share of struggles. And, and you know what, though? I actually think that the Haiti connection is apropos to our conversation because think of all the very faithful Christians of Haiti and the ones who seek to live in the way that God wants them to live. And yet, mm. unlike Americans, their lives aren't filled with the same kinds of material blessings, you know, the same yeah. sort of things that, that that we're saying, you know, seek after wisdom instead of these things. You know, they – I think they – oh, gosh. I hate to say this, but I'm, I'll just say it and write if you don't like what I say. But but I think it's a little easier for them because they're not as distracted mm. by those worldly things. Now, they're distracted by the need to make ends meet and fulfill their basic human necessities, and that certainly is a distraction that the that the accuser will use. But I also – I've seen such joy on their faces. You know, you hear the stories where they walk miles uh, to go to church and they do it in, in joy. And so there is something about yeah. the fact that Jesus drew to him the most, um, the people who are struggling the most. Well, we see that even in uh, underdeveloped countries or, or countries like Haiti. Yeah, um, Mitch Album, who was, uh, I think, Detroit Free Press columnist forever and then became famous with his book Tuesdays with Maury and then even wrote after that. He's a Christian and operates an orphanage in Haiti and was in Haiti when all of this went down and he was airlifted out. And he's given interviews that describe what it was like from his perspective. And he talks about you know, the fear that he had and the fear that his 
you know, traveling companions had. He goes every month, so he's kind of more accustomed to it. But then he talked about the kids just singing in worship to the Lord, almost unfazed, you know, like they were so strong in faith and it was so like, they just had so much confidence that the Lord would see them through that it was inspiring to him who kind of was more taken in by the worry and concern. It's worth looking up. Oh, I I think I will. You know, basically just to say it simply, if you're accustomed to relying on God for every single meal and not really able to provide for yourself in the way that you would like, when yep. things get tough, it's a lot easier to come, keep on relying on God. But, but we have this mythos that we go out, we work, we make money, uh, we buy uh, nice cars and good food and decent houses. And then suddenly, and, and then suddenly, if something goes bad, we're like, why me, God? <laughs> as as yeah. if we haven't been abundantly blessed. But anyway, we don't want to, uh, I guess, belabor that too much. Um, anything else about these first 20 verses? Um, we're right up here against a break, so I don't want to go into the next section too much. Yeah, you know, I would add, I was a little first thought taken by verse 16. Um, it's talking about wisdom, right? The she long life is in her right hand in her left hand are riches and honor. So it, it could bend towards the idea that, Hey, if you're, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and wisdom that's found in Yahweh, you know, the result is going to be long life. Well, unfortunately, Pastor Boo, like me, you've probably seen faithful, faithful, faithful servants of the Most High God pass away and go to heaven well before they anticipated going there, right? Sure, right. So we have to come to terms with, well, what does that mean, you know, long life. And I guess what I eventually settled on, I did look to see what some other smarter people than me had to say about this. Um, You know, 60 great years following the Lord are a lot better than, you know, 85 miserable ones, you know, or 38 years of a beautiful life with long days, if you will, good days, filled days, um, Jesus says in John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. Those days are way better than, you know, what someone else might call quote unquote long life, but not a fulfilled, happy life. So that's how I kind of come to grips with, um, mm-hmm. what, what the Lord is speaking about here in chapter three, verse 16. The long life, you know, we, we have a culture that equates a good life with a long life. And, yeah. and this is why. We have uh, medical centers that look like palaces and cathedrals, mm-hmm. and, and this is why many people toward the end of their life, or if the Lord should decide that, that they might end their life early through some debilitating disease, they will spend untold amounts of fortune and time mm-hmm. trying to eke out just a little bit more. And, mm-hmm. I, and, I, and people can do what they want, but I just want to make it clear, as, as, as you already have, that, yeah, a good life— it does not equal long, you know, but I understand what you're saying, too. We have to contend with the word actually being referring to length. It is talking about long. But but at the same time, I think it's also used sort of metaphorically elsewhere as as a feeling, you know. So I, I, I definitely agree that there's something more yeah. than just a length of days. And then and then, of course, it's and we're right here at break. But long life's in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. And I'm, is that because life is pre, predominant over and against riches and honor, even though you might get them? Because Proverbs 22, verse 4 says, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. So mm. I don't know. It's just kind of an, it's an interesting juxtaposition because it seems to be pretty on the surface level saying, hey, if you have wisdom. You live like God wants you to live, you're going to have a long life, and you're going to have uh, riches and honor. I I don't know. Maybe we'll pick that up. Actually, right up against the break, so I can't – I'm not going to let you jump in. Think about it, and we'll come back in just a few minutes. And, folks, we'll keep on going with Proverbs chapter 3. Everybody, we'll see you on the other side after these messages.
These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me this morning, it's the Reverend Brian Davies. He's the pastor of Lord of Glory Lutheran Church in Grays Lake, Illinois. Don't forget that you can contact me at pastorboo at gmail.com or on Facebook or by phone with your comments, questions, complaints, concerns, whatever you want to talk about, as long as it has to do with our topic. And that number, if you want to call in, is 1-800-730-2727. Okay, oh, let's get into some more of our text versus, uh, well, actually, no, I said you could jump in. Did you want to say anything else about uh I'm about good, I'm really good. Let's keep moving. I would do. So let's move on to 21 through 27. Here we go. My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for Yahweh will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Okay. Okay. So we have another large chunk to go after this, but we'll just look at this. Lots of stuff in here. Um, so one of our previous guests, and I think he was wise to do so, made a distinction between principles and promises. Um, and so the, the con- concept was that here we don't have a bunch of promises that if you do this by, you know, in no uncertain terms, this will happen, but rather principles. Things will go better for you when you do these things. But I don't know, it's hard to not hear the absolute language in which Solomon describes, you know, when you lie down, if you have wisdom, your sleep's going to be sweet. You don't have to Mm. worry about things. I don't know. What do you think? Oh, man, that's a really helpful distinction. The only thing I would add to it would be, and I do think it's, I, I, I would teach that and preach that and use that in counseling sessions for sure. But I would also just point to the fact that like all of those principles, which may not be promises now, will come to fulfillment at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? I mean, like, all of these things, like, if you hang on to them, yes, it's only a principle. So you you may, rough things may come your way, but at the end of time, like, it will be a promise fulfilled. But I do think the principles and promises thing is a helpful distinction because, Sometimes things don't break the way of the follower of wisdom. They just don't. Um, uh, in this world, you will have trouble, like Jesus promises that. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's what we struggle with, though. You know, we think of uh, a raise up, uh, um, raise up your child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. Uh, or I might be paraphrasing a little bit. But, but yeah. people look at that and they say, well, I raised up my children in the faith and they did depart from it. And so it becomes a struggle, you know, it's like, well, Lord, I'm, I'm seeking after your will. I want your wisdom. Um, I, I'm trying to walk on your way, but my foot is stumbling. I'm losing right. sleep. I, I am in terror. You know, what do That's we say right. to those folks? I guess I would say uh, Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. Meaning like it may not be breaking your way right now, but God is still at work even if we don't see it right now. So even if you're struggling with your sleep or uh, your foot is slipping or, or you literally, you, you you had a fall, your foot slipped, like that happens. Um, the principle, the guiding principle is still true. No, and I, I agree with that. You know, I think it's just a struggle for us humans. And I think this is why prosperity preachers or, or those adjacent to that 
uh, get so much traction because it, it, I, I guess I'm reminded of um, Martha, who Jesus says, you know, he will rise again, talking about her brother Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. And, 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 and she goes, well, I know he'll rise in the resurrection. I mean, it's almost mm. like, yeah, I get it. You know, there is the promised land of the new heavens and the new earth. Yes, we will rise again in life. But people are, are often seeking those blessings in this life. And I don't. Yeah. And I'm not, and God does provide them, though. I don't want to dissuade people that's to say, well, everything that's good about being a Christian will happen after you're dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, but at the same time, we also can't ignore the struggles we face in this life. And I, it's a, it's an intentional tension that I think the Lord invites us into. Um, and you're exactly right. Uh, Christianity is not just like a divine Roth IRA that we put money in now and it's really hard, <laughs> but one day we're going to, it's going to pay off. No. And I think if anything, this chapter points us to the here and now blessings of life following the way of wisdom, the following the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the best way. And I think that's why in verse 21, it says, hey, don't lose sight of these. Like, just think about all the things that you don't want to lose sight of, right? Like your kids, your pets, like things that are important to you. You want to know where they are at all times. You care about them. They're on, they're front of mind. And that's 21 here. Hey, don't lose sight of this. Keep this front of mind. Keep this front of mind. Um, keep sound wisdom before you. Um, and they're going to be life for you and adornment for your neck. Like it's going to be the guiding principle for your life. It's going to be, it's going to be a blessing to you. So, you know, the adornment for your neck, uh, you know, we have people, why do people wear jewelry? Right. So people will wear jewelry, I think to draw attention to themselves a little bit. Everybody has a little vanity in themselves. They want to appear perhaps, uh, as, as wealthy or blessed, uh, they want to increase their own attractiveness, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what does Solomon say? What does God say through Solomon? He says, wisdom will do that. Wisdom mm. enhances your character just as jewelry makes you uh, appear more attractive. You know, by being wise, and I think of Paul's uh, admonition to the women of, I guess, Corinth, if I remember correctly. You know, it's like, you know, it's 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 faithfulness that you will wear and will be part of part of your beauty uh, more than just sort of dolling up and putting a bunch of beads and stuff in your hair. So for men and women, you know, if you want to be respected, say, even in the world, it's to have good wisdom, good character. Uh, and of course, true and profitable wisdom is only that which is from God. And if you walk in those ways, then, as we've been saying, ten, then things will tend to go better because you're operating in concert with the way God created things to be. Mm. But it doesn't, of course, inoculate you against all adversity. Yeah, it's a really nice treatment on verse 22 and the adornment around your neck. I fully echo that. And the only thing I'd add to that would be like people wear things that are like speaking to their sense of self or identity, like things they want to proclaim to the outside world about who they are. And I think that's that's why we wear wisdom as well in our as we bear out the fruit of the spirit in our lives, it's saying, this is who I am and this is who I want to be. And, and, you know, so he says in verse 25, do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked or the storm of the wicked. The Hebrew could be translated uh, when it comes. Hmm. I, I think that we could overlook if we read too fast. So, Part of the problem, especially as we Christians in our own sinfulness look out in the world and we say, and the Bible addresses this in so many spots, but we say, look, the wicked seem to be, you know, the rich are getting richer. The wicked are stepping on others and achieving these, these luxurious lifestyles and, and not all of them, but just it seems like so many of them. Or, or the wealthier you become, people start turning away from God and relying on themselves and their own wealth. And so I think there is part of us as Christians who say, we want to be vindicated. And of course, mm. vengeance is the Lord, says the Bible. And here we're also reminded that the ruin of the wicked, regardless of whatever status, condition, or, or station they have in life, it is coming. But here we are being told that wisdom will help prevent us from being afraid when it comes. Because if, if Yahweh is our confidence, if our faith, hope, and trust is in the Lord and not in our own things— then there's no need to worry when those things are 
you know, rent away from us or when judgment comes. Yeah, when implies a reality, right? Like, it's going to happen. It, it strikes me a little bit on uh, Eclipse Day or whatever it is we're calling today. You know, <laughs> maybe you've seen the messaging out there. You know, this is another sign. You know, we just had an earthquake in New Jersey. We all these like physical signs of the earth. Now we have an eclipse and it's like, man, how much does the world run around looking for signs? Um, and so it says here, as someone who follows the way of wisdom, we're not going to be afraid of sudden terror. Like this is not living in fear is not in our radar. We're people who live by the power and promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't have to live in fear. I, you, oh, I'm glad you brought that up because it's such a beautiful point and it fits exactly here. Um, having mm-hmm. knowledge is to say, oh, look, the uh, the path of the past few eclipses kind of sort of makes a Paleolithic alpha. That's sort of knowledge. A wisdom <laughs> is not making the next conclusion. Well, if Jesus is the alpha and the omega, then this is the beginning of the end and wh- whatever they're coming up with. You know, mm. uh, dispensationalists, they have a great imagination. But but the, the point is, um, yeah, well, so when bad things happen, like earthquakes or bridges collapsing or or towers coming down or wars or even when natural occurrences happen that might be frightening so i'm thinking of tornadoes or tsunamis or for some i suppose an eclipse so 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 we don't have to be afraid because our That's confidence right. isn't in these things but in the wisdom that we come from god and that wisdom tells us that even if god should be uh, judging the world through, say, natural phenomenon, we don't have to worry about that because our confidence that's is right. in Christ. Our that's confidence right. is in Christ. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, this next section, uh, 28 through 35, starts to turn the tables a little bit. It talks about basically the treatment of others. But we're going to focus on just 28 through 31, which stops us in the middle of a thought, but that's okay. Here we go. 28. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. Now, the reasons why we shouldn't do those things are the next four verses. But stopping there for a moment. This is where it starts to get kind of proverbsy. <laughs> we don't expect this till ten, but we're we're mm. getting some like, hey, um, don't be a jerk, which is the eleventh mm. commandment, if you ask me. All right? So don't <laughs> don't be a jerk to people. But but other than that, take us through these things, right? So being wise is also about not just what we believe, but how we treat others. Yeah, and I think it has um, after a really nice treatment of our vertical relationship with God, it now is going to transition to horizontally how we live with one another. Uh, I think you're wise to pull out, hey, this this says echoes of the Ten Commandments, and I think it does. This would be Eighth Commandment um, language. This would be Ninth and Tenth Commandment language. Um, How you treat one another is going to be an important part of how you live out wisdom. Just think about it this way. If we lived out wisdom with our God, but then were cruel to our neighbor, what kind of faith would that be, right? But the faith that's presented to us in the Bible is one that is, you know, confessing our sin to God, receiving his grace, being completely driven by our identity with him, but then in loving service to our neighbor, like they go together. They're two sides of the same coin. And so I think it's really nice that Proverbs 3 gives us treatment after so much beautiful language about staying connected to God. Now it's going to say, now live it out with your neighbor. As Luther said, right, it's not God that needs your good works, your neighbor does. And so I I love how you brought up two kinds of righteousness, right? So we have a righteousness between uh, us and God, which is that vertical and then the righteousness that we express uh, in the way that we live for others, the horizontal righteousness. Yep. And so um, as we look at that, as we look at how we can serve others, how we can keep the Ten Commandments, not just avoid breaking them, um, we find ourselves basically dealing with the wisdom of God. We wouldn't know any of those things if God had not told us. Frankly, let's look at the first 28. 
go and come again tomorrow, I will give it. Don't say that if you have it right then. Basically, don't put off your neighbor. Don't blow off your neighbor. Um, but but that's kind of the natural reaction for some people. Uh, me, I'm kind of an introverted person. If my neighbor knocked on the door, I might look out the window and go, hmm, am I, am I kind of emotionally ready to have a visitor? But if they're <laughs> needing something, the point is you got to consider your neighbor over and against yourself sometimes. Not to the neglect of yourself, but sometimes over and against yourself. Yeah. And speaking of neighbors, you know, don't be a jerk. Don't plan evil if you have a neighbor who's dealing with lives right next to you they trust you don't use that trust against them don't fight with people if he hasn't done anything to you um and 31 is especially don't envy a man of violence now that one slows me down a little bit because what does it look like to envy a man of violence and and guess what i came up with was simply what i mentioned earlier you look at the wicked and you go, look at how far they're getting ahead in this world because of how they live. But maybe I'm missing the point. Do you see that in a different way or is that about right? No, I don't. I, I see it really, really similarly. Um, but I guess to add on to it would be, you know, don't use the ways and methods of the world and how they interact with each other as the ways in which we should interact with one another. Right. I mean, I just see a world that makes other people the enemy and is always trying to win every argument and put people down and, um, you know, have the correct hot take for, for social media, like the Christian, the way of, uh, the way of wisdom, the way of Yahweh is not a way that seeks to win in the same way that the world seeks to win over another. I had a professor, not a Lutheran, actually. It was at Bethel University, and we weren't talking about doctrinal issues. We were talking about other types of things, but he said something which I found was profound. I think it can be taken too far, but I I liked it, and he said, sometimes the relationship you have with other people is more important than being right. Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't to say you can't stand up for true doctrine or that you should just ignore the truth or if someone says, hey, you know, I'm a – I'm a banana now. You have to refer to me as a banana that you can just do that. But at the same time, there are plenty of times in our lives where it's like, do I really have to win? Do I really have to Mm. own these enemies? And and even as we consider those who are outside the Christian faith, even those who have set themselves up as enemies of God, do we really – are we called to treat them as enemies? No, we're called to treat them as people for whom Christ died. But yet we don't. In, in in large swaths uh, of the way we behave, we think of uh, owning the libs or all the or the progressives or the people who have have uh, the critical interpreters of the Bible or the people who have rejected Christ. These are all bad people to avoid. Now, we do remember, though, of course, that there is coming recompense from the Lord. This next section is going to speak on it. But as it applies to us. We're not to cause trouble, frankly. Again, don't be jerks. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It, w- really well said and echo it in terms of like, it's so easy to like echo back the way that we see around us, like the way people talk about one another and talk to one another. And I think the way of wisdom points us to something way better. And so this is what is way better. These last four verses and, and basically In terms of those who are going to – well, let's just read it first, and then we'll talk about it. Verse 32 through 35, which will finish up the chapter. For the devious – or actually, I'm going to start at 31 so it makes more sense. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. For the devious person is an abomination to Yahweh, but the upright are in his confidence. Yahweh's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. The wise will inherit honor, but fools will get disgrace. Now, my first thought is, my first thought is, aha, see, you be righteous and just know that all those unrighteous people out there will get theirs. But (laughs) if I take half a second, (laughs) I think, wait a minute, this isn't about them. It's about me. It's about us. Mm -hmm. It's about how we behave. It's not saying, oh, those devious people will get theirs. It's saying, don't be a devious person or you will get yours. 
I don't know. Maybe I'm being too specific. What do you think about these last few verses? Um, I, I agree with you. You got to be really careful. Like, don't make this an us versus them. I guess I just thinking of what Luther said, I open the Bible, I see Jesus on every page. Like, where is Jesus here? Um, just for the record, like outside of Jesus, I am not the righteous, right? Like I am the one who deserves the full weight of God's wrath upon me. So I am um, in the house of the wicked, a part of Jesus. I am not in the dwelling of the righteous apart from Jesus. But because of what Jesus has done and won for me, because of what he has accomplished, I am then put completely because of his work in the camp of the righteous and in the camp of that who receives the blessing of the Lord God through Jesus Christ. So then it kind of compels me like, I want everyone to be in that camp too. And I want everyone to experience the blessings and providence of the Lord God almighty. I want everyone I know to be, um, experience the blessing of dwelling in safety, right? We want that. And so this to me is almost like a missional verse. Like let's get out there and tell the story. Mm -hmm. Well, and you said, where is Jesus in the, in the, in the scriptures here? And I think you're wise to point us back to that. And I would say, and this is again off the cuff, but I would say we find ourselves again. I don't like the us versus them because I just hear that too much. You know, we're the righteous, they're the wicked. They'll get theirs when time comes. Now, I think there is an aspect of that we find in the scriptures, but to to be boastful in that, I think misses the point. Really, yep. we are the devious person. We are in the household that's cursed. We are the ones who are uh, God has scorned us, and we are the ones who will get disgraced except for Jesus. Jesus, you know, cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree, and yet Jesus becomes an abomination. Jesus, you know, is cursed for us. Jesus is scorned mm -hmm. by God. Why have you forsaken me? And, of course, how many people, we think of the Alexander Mos Grafito, how many people uh, have mocked over the centuries the fact that Christ died on the cross. He is the one that has gotten disgrace. Now, he triumphs over those in his resurrection, but yeah, he took all of those because we're the ones who deserve these things. I, at least that's how I'm seeing it and what I'm hearing from totally. you, and it sounds good to me. Totally, and it just, again, centers us back as Lutheran Christians, back to the cross and empty tomb as the defining attribute of how we read the scriptures, that yes, the Lord Jesus Christ, he who had no sin became sin so that I might know the righteousness of God. Like <clears throat> he received the Lord's, he received the father's curse. Um, and he did that all for me. And then now because of that, um, I have life eternal, not because of anything I've done or because of how righteous I live or how wise I live. No, solely because of Jesus Christ. And then now because that's been done for me, what's the best way to live life? Like, and the best way to live life is walking in the way that the Lord has called me to live. It's a life of joy and fulfillment and peace and so much more. Agreed. Agreed. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I am I am destined to end this show on time instead of late for once, and I'm going to do it today. So, <laughs> Eddie, you have like 30 seconds to a minute if you want to make any final comments. No, just um, a wise person once told me the book of Proverbs, I think, has 31 chapters for a reason, 31 months, 31 days in most months. How blessing and what a blessing it is to read the book of Proverbs a little bit every day and uh, let the Lord have its work with us. Uh, amen. And certainly something I encourage amongst our listeners and myself as we're diving in deep to Proverbs. Well, folks, I'd like to thank my guest this morning. He's been the Reverend Brian Davies, pastor of Lord of Glory Lutheran Church in Grays Lake, Illinois. Brother, thanks for being on the show again. A pleasure. See you again soon. Yep. Can't wait to have you back. All right. Thanks. Tomorrow, the Reverend John Lekomsky comes on the program for Chapter 4. This chapter begins with a father encouraging his sons to embrace, well, what else? Godly wisdom. But he cites his own father's teaching to illustrate wisdom's value and a, its ability to guide one toward righteousness and away from wickedness. A, a wisdom that's passed down through the generations. He then contrasts that prosperous path of wisdom with the ruinous ways of the wicked. 
And then in the final set of instructions, there's kind of three sections. The father advises his son to steadfastly follow the path of wisdom so that he can focus on having a purity of heart to navigate life in the way that God would want him to. So we have a lot to talk about tomorrow as we continue to open up Proverbs. Hey, if you're like, hey, where are the Proverbs? Well, that's chapter 10. There's a lot to get through before we get there. But until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word. 